in our second session the revealing of the big picture. We see the, um, we see the issue of the big picture. We're going to fill in some of the details and watch how the program and how God's Word unfolds and lays itself out. And I've, I've entitled this second section, Prophecy and the Mystery, because there, we, we, we dealt with that just a little bit about, um, about what was taking place in the Old Testament. We really didn't give, give you a label to it. But it's important to follow the progression and how God's Word is revealed progressively. We saw that at, at one point... Some people didn't even understand Jesus was going to die, and yet they're preaching and they have a ministry um, and, and carrying on a ministry while the Lord was on earth. Very different today. We tell people all the time about Christ dying for their sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And salvation is, is eternal life and a free gift. So we're going to be looking at, we saw the big picture. There's a, there's, a, there's a wonderful verse, and if you have your Bible, you can open up to it. But I'm going to put the verse on the screen here. There's a verse in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, that uh, gives us the instruction how to study the Bible. It says in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Is this the word of truth? It's all God's word. There's a verse in 2 Timothy that says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All of this book from cover to cover is God's inspired word. And so, so it's all God's word. And yet, I, just a couple of examples we saw in our previous study, that there are differences in different places. It makes a difference where you're reading in the Bible. It's important to know who is being talked to. And what is the goal? What is the purpose at the time? So that's why we have time past and but now and the ages to come. We have to know where we're at. We have to know who is speaking. So there are natural divisions and distinctions in the Bible so that we can understand. Otherwise, we'll be confused. We'll say, well, he said this here, but he said this over here. Have you ever heard anybody say there are contradictions in the Bible? So that's, that's usually said by somebody who doesn't spend a whole lot of time studying the Bible. They're just trying to deflect and don't want to. They're saying that because somebody else told it. There are no contradictions in the Bible. There are differences that need to be recognized. And when you recognize the distinction and the difference, it's not a con contradiction. It's a contrast. There's a difference, isn't there? So we're going to be looking at, in the remainder of our time, some of the natural divisions and distinctions to recognize in God's Word. One of them is prophecy and mystery. Um, the, the issue of, of something that God has been speaking about uh, from day one. Come to, come to the book of Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Um, New Testament, you got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John, the very next book is the book of Acts. We're going to be spending quite a bit of time in Acts, um, in our in our sessions this morning, so and this afternoon, but it'll be be helpful to you if you if you know where the book of Acts is. Acts chapter number three, and verse number twenty one. Uh, verse twenty, Acts three twenty. He says, "He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things." which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, how long? Since the world began. God has been talking about something from the get-go. So we're going to put our basic chart up here once again. And basically we're thinking in terms of a timeline. We're thinking in terms of the past, the present, and the future. So we have this passage here, Acts chapter 3, Verse 21, God has been talking about something. We call that prophecy. He's been speaking about it from the beginning all the way down to the point where here where, where Peter is talking here in the book of Acts. Um, look at verse um, 24, Acts chapter 3 and verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, 
have likewise foretold of these days. He just said in chapter 2 that these are the last days. Prophecy points to an end game, points to a goal, points to the, to, to the climax. And we saw that the issue of a kingdom, that, that the nation of Israel would have an everlasting land as their possession, and there was going to be a king that was going to reign and rule and execute judgment and justice on the earth. That's the end game. He says in verse 25 here, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham. Now who is Abraham? He was the father of the Jewish race. So who is Peter talking to here? He's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews about something that God has been talking about from the very beginning. Verse 25 again, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Who is the you? It's important to ask yourself a little question. Who is being talked to, and what are they talking about? Jesus was sent to his people. Is that because God didn't love everybody else? No. It just means he gave the Gentiles up because they didn't want to have anything to do with him. He's forming his own nation as a light. I've got my people, and my people will represent me. Look to them. But what's the problem? God's people are in a mess. <laughs> So the appeal here in the book of Acts is for the Jewish people to get their act together so they can be the light, so they can be the blessing to the rest of the world. And so that's what he's dealing with here. Something that he's been talking about and speaking about since the world began. Here's this covenant here in verse 25. The father saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Prophecy has its basis has its foundation in that promise that God made to Abraham that we look back at and in Genesis chapter number 12. God says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a land. And in that land, you're going to be a blessing to the entire world. Now, the book of Ephesians talked about the covenants and promises. There are three main covenants. And, you know, in your, in your booklet... Um, through the Bible in seven hours I think it's the, the second or the third chapter it talks about these we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at them but there were three basic promises there was God says Abraham I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you a nation I'm going to give you a land and you're going to be a blessing in the Old Testament God made a promise about the it, we, we call it the pa Palestinian covenant he says I'm going to give you the land for an everlasting possession. A nation needs a land. Then he says, and we looked at this verse, we looked at David, and God says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. You know what was going to make Israel a great nation? Was their great king. David was a great king, but David's seed was the ultimate king, wasn't it? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that's really going to make them a great nation. And then he, then he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. A new covenant. If Israel was going to be a blessing, you know what the problem with, with the Jews are? The Jews have the same problem you and I are. You and I have. We're kin to our father Adam. We have something inside that's, we have the, the, the old human nature from Adam. And we're selfish. We have... Um, the, 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 when we're really honest, we know that we've got problems in our heart. And it's not just a question of trying to go out and be good socially and morally and culturally. If you're really going to be a blessing, you need a new heart. And God says, you guys can't, you guys can't do it on your own because God gave them the law. 
So there's these three covenants. We're not going to we're not going to dwell a lot on that, but those three are really an expansion of the first one. They kind of flow out because to Abraham God promised a land, a great nation, and a new heart. And so those are going to be some things that God will do. Those are some other of those promises that God gave to the Jewish people. You know why he gave them those promises? Because he also gave them the law. Come back to the book of Exodus. You have the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus. Um, as God formed his nation, he made these promises. He says, Israel, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you the land. But then he also gave Israel the law. The book of Galatians says the law was added to the promise. I want you to, to look at this, and this is one of, the, one of the differences. This is why it's important to recognize the difference between law and grace. Um, what did he say to Abraham back at the beginning? He just said, I will. I'm going to do it for you, Abraham. Those other co covenants that we had there, God says, I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you a king. And I'm going to give you a new heart. You know why he says, I'm going to give it to you? Because you guys couldn't do it on your own. God gave them this law. And look how the law works. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. He says, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagle wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Do you see that if, then? <laughs> if you keep the covenant, if you keep the law, if you obey, he says, what am I going to do? Then I'm going to bless you. Well, okay, but what's the other side of the coin? What happens if you don't? <laughs> Most people think that the law was given as a standard for Israel to shoot for. Here's what I want you to do. There's the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots and the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. You know, do those things and I'll be happy with you and I'll bless you. What's the problem? We don't always do the things we should. And so God gave Israel the law to teach them that they couldn't do it on their own. Because there's that if then, if you don't obey, then I'll curse you. See, there's two sides to the coin, right? And you know what Israel says? Okay, we'll do it. That's just what people do with religion. God, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Well, what the law is going to teach Israel is that they can't. And even after their failure, God says, even after you fail to obey, I'm going to give you the land. Even after you fail to obey, I'm going to give you a great king. And even though David's descendants failed again and again and again, there's going to still have that future king. And because you couldn't keep that law and keep those commandments, you know why? Because you just didn't have the natural ability to do it. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put my life inside of you and enable you and give you power to do what you can't do on your own. Isn't that wonderful? Those, those covenants and promises are I wills, but here the law is added as a teacher. It teaches man, it teaches Israel that they need God to do it for them. Because as long as man thinks he's going to be, thinks he can do it, guess what he's going to do? He's going to try to do it. That's his own, that's his human nature. Now there's something interesting in here. Um, look at verse number 6, Exodus 19, 6. It shall be, and, and ye shall be unto me, a what? A kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. We all know what a priest is, don't we? A priest is a go-between. There's an individual priest. The nation of Israel had the Levites and so on. People have religious figures today. A priest is somebody that goes in between, right? Well, he says here, Israel, 
you're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. How is God ultimately going to use the nation of Israel to be a blessing to all families of the earth? They were going to be a priestly nation. They were going to be a go-between between between God and and the rest of the world. They were going to have to come to God through the Jewish people. That was their purpose. Because you know what? Back here for 2,000 years, we don't have the 2,000 there, man failed on his own. So God says, I'm going to raise up my own nation. I'm going to bless them, and I'm I'm going to make them great, and they'll be the light, and you can come to me through them. That phrase, kingdom of priests, you see how the issue is still that future kingdom out there? Now, come with me to the, um, um, to the book of Matthew. Um, I, tell you, I tell you what, no. <laughs> right in the middle of your Old Testament, here I go making references and confusing people again, find the book of Isaiah, okay? The book of Psalms, everybody knows where Psalms is. It's the biggest book in the Old Testament. It's right in the middle of your Bible. Find the book of Psalms and just begin to go to the right. And I want to show you something here. Isaiah chapter number 61. See, you got lots of chapters to look for. Uh, There's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Find the book of Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 61. And what we have here in the book of Isaiah is we have a prophecy of Jesus Christ himself. So we have the Old Testament. We have the nation of Israel, their covenants and their promises. The Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is his very very first sermon, time-wise, is recorded for us in the book of Luke, chapter 4. And he goes into a synagogue at Capernaum and he preaches. And he opens up the book of Isaiah. And he reads a prophecy. He reads a prophecy about himself. It's fascinating. Well, here, Isaiah chapter 61, we are looking at the passage that the Lord Jesus Christ quotes as he gives his first sermon in the book of Luke. Okay? Look at Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. And tell me if this doesn't sound like Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the, and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all that mourn. Now think about Jesus Christ. Remember, wasn't he baptized by John the Baptist? And when he came up out of the water, John says, I saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. And they heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That happens to Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. And he begins to preach his his very first sermon. After that, he quotes this passage. He quotes a passage uh, about himself. And so what is the Lord doing? Here it says, He sent me to, to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening of the prison and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Look at verse 2. The prophecy in Isaiah here says, And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So the Lord Jesus Christ begins his ministry. What is he preaching? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's that kingdom. But you know what happens before that kingdom is, is set up? There is some days of vengeance. Now, it's interesting, in the book of Luke, the Lord doesn't quote this part of the passage. He stops because he tells those people, the Spirit is upon me, and I'm preaching, and this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I'm here. The prophets told about me. Here I am. He doesn't quote that part, but in the passage here, you see how how the pattern is still the same, isn't it? You've got the kingdom at hand, So that's that kingdom where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on the earth, preceded by by a time of vengeance. Verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty 
for ashes, and the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, he that, uh, that he might be glorified. He's going he's to bring comfort. He's going to bring joy. He's going to take beauty for ashes. <laughs> Israel in their history was, was uh, constant disappointment. They had some high spots, but they, at this point in time, they're under the iron fist of Rome. They're, they're anything but a great nation. They're a subject nation. There's sadness, and they need comfort, and they need joy, and they need hope. And their king is there. And he says, I'm going to give you joy for your mourning. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to make you pray so that the Lord can be glorified. So here's the Lord. That's what the Lord's preaching. The kingdom is at hand, the time for comfort, the time for joy. Look how the passage continues. Verse number four. And they shall build the old wastes, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Who are the strangers? Those are the Gentiles down here. They were aliens and strangers. Those are the people. You know what he's saying? The Gentiles are going to come and bless you, Israel. They're going to be serving you, Israel. Verse 5, the strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the alien. That's a foreigner. The, the, the Gentiles were aliens and strangers. They didn't have access to those covenants and promises. What he's saying here is the, the strangers, the aliens, the foreigners, the Gentiles, they're going to come and they're going to bless you. They're going to serve you. They're going to be at your feet. They're going to be underneath your table <laughs> ministering like that woman of Canaan. The sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. They'll be tending to your crops and cutting your grass and and, uh, and, and harvesting your, your fruits and so on. But look at verse 6. But ye shall be named the what? The priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame, verse 7, ye shall have double, and for your confusion... They shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Does that sound like a good time? <laughs> he says, you be named priests. What were they going to, what did God say? If they obeyed, they were going to be priests. They were going to be a kingdom of priests. The prophet Isaiah, look at here in your, look, look, notice on the screen. The Lord Jesus Christ, he continues, that, that passage continues talking about the future. When Israel will be comforted and Israel will be blessed and the Gentiles will acknowledge who Israel is and, and their king is going to be on the earth and Israel is going to be the priests of the Lord. They're going to be the official representatives. Does that sound like a good time? It sounds like a great time for them. Israel, that, the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching about that future time for them. Come back to the book of Matthew now with me. So the Lord continues his earthly ministry. Matthew, Come to Matthew chapter number 19. Very first book again in your New Testament. Try to make these a little bit easier for you to find. Matthew chapter 19. The Lord Jesus Christ is ministering with his disciples once again. He's heading to Jerusalem, but he's preaching and teaching in, in Jerusalem. Look at what he tells his 12 disciples. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Ye that which have followed me, and followed me in the regeneration, notice it, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Who's the Son of Man? Isn't that Jesus Christ? When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. When is that? It's going to be in that kingdom when he's sitting on his throne, ruling over the entire earth. He's, and, he, and here he's talking to his 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, notice the end of verse 28, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones, 
why would there be 12 thrones and not 6 or 14 or 20? Because there's 12 tribes of Israel. There you go. Ye shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. See that number 12? 12 is the number of governmental perfection. You, here you see a verse of, about the structure of that kingdom out there. As they're going to be a kingdom of priests. It's going to be a religious kingdom. And that kingdom is going to be di di divided into 12 sections. And each of those 12 apostles is going to sit on a throne. And underneath that, 12, underneath that apostle is going to be one of those 12 tribes of Israel in that kingdom. And Israel is going to be ruling with the Lord Jesus Christ with their king. And they're going to be a kingdom of priests. Isn't that a glorious time? You get an idea of the structure of that kingdom. Come over to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. He says, When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Let's start with uh, number 31. Matthew 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit... Where? Upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them, the one from the other, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. He shall set the, set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on the left. Look at verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them, Come on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the what? The kingdom prepared for you from when? From the foundation of the world. Where is the foundation of the world? Doesn't that go all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter number 1 and verse 1? The Lord here in his earthly ministry, he's prophesying, notice on the chart there, he's prophesying about that future time. The 12 apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones. And there's going to be a kingdom established that, that he has been talking about and preparing from when? All the way back to the beginning. What happened in the beginning? He took Adam and Eve. He put them on the earth. And what did he tell Adam? Go have dominion over the earth and subdue it. Be my monarch on the earth. How did that work? <laughs> he failed, didn't he? And uh, he failed to fulfill God's purpose. But that, my point is, from the beginning, what's the issue been? The issue has been setting up and reclaiming and bringing order to this earth through a kingdom vested in the nation of Israel with the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on a throne and the 12 apostles ruling with him and Israel being a kingdom of priests and blessing flowing from who? The nation of Israel and their people. A glorious, glorious time. And so you see those things there very clearly. So the Lord Jesus Christ is ministering here in the book of Matthew. You know what happens in chapter 26, 27, and 28? That's when he, uh, well, there's his coming. I guess i gotta, I got to get that. He's going to come back and sit on the throne of his glory. Um, but what happens? 26, 27, 28, he's rejected. He's put on trial. He's brutally crucified on the cross and raises from the dead and carries on his ministry. Now we have the book of Acts. We've already looked at some of those things. The book of Acts, go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we looked at this once before, verse 17. I told you we were going to spend some time in the book of Acts. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days. The question and the issue is still restoring that kingdom to the nation of Israel there and the fulfillment of prophecy. What does he say in verse 16? This is that which was spoken by who? The prophet Joel. He's, he's going to fulfill and he's going he's to fulfill what he has been talking about and been speaking about since the world began. He's been talking about it all along. And what I want to do now in just the time that we have left, turn over with me to the book of Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter 4. The 12 apostles and the disciples continue to minister there in the early chapters of the book of Acts. The Lord Jesus Christ has been rejected. He's gone away. He's in heaven. 
And there's this ministry that the 12 apostles have there in the book of Acts. And what we're about to look at here, to me, is one of the most fascinating and exciting things about prophecy in the Bible. Um, look at Acts chapter 4. As the persecution by the Jews to the 12 apostles and their ministry um, carries on, in Acts chapter number 4, verse 24, Peter begins to speak. He says, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God. That's a good, that's a good position to be in, right? He's, he's, he's the boss. Thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth. You're the creator and the sea and all that in them is. And beginning in verse 25, we have an Old Testament quote from the book of Psalms describing the situation right here that, and the events that have recently taken place. Um, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage? Now, who are, who are the heathen in your Bible? The Gentiles, right? And the people imagine vain things. The people are going to be the people of Israel. You got, the, you got those two groups. You got the Gentiles, so they're the heathen, and you got the people of Israel. Verse 26, the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Who would, be, who would the kings? Wouldn't it be Pontius Pilate and Herod and uh, those people that, that put Jesus on trial? Verse 27, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Do you see that collection there, that cluster? The Gentiles and the rulers in Israel and the kings. All of them together, what do they do? They're shaking their fist at God, and they're going to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 28, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Well, the, the, the cross was in the plan. I want you to come back with me to the book of Psalms. Again, easy to find, right in the middle of your Old Testament. Get the book of Psalms, chapter 2. Here is the passage that Peter and those apostles quote in its prophetic context. Remember where we're at. We're right here shortly after Jesus has died. He's risen from the dead. He's ascended up to heaven. And Peter is talking about the events of the cross, the events of the crucifixion. Psalm chapter number 2. And by the way, the book of Psalms is largely prophetic. It's not just the, the warm little fuzzy, you know, uh, devotional thoughts. It is, there is a lot of that. But the book of Psalms are prophetic. They look ahead. Here's the passage. And it's going to read just like we just read in the book of Acts. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Why are they doing all of that at the crucifixion? They want to get rid of him. They will not have this man to reign over us. Jesus Christ was rocking the world of the Jewish nation. He was stirring the pot and making things difficult for the Roman Empire. All this unrest. We've got to get rid of this guy. He says in verse 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he ascended up? You know what it says in, in Acts chapter 2? He sat down at the right hand of the Father. So this is, this is he's speaking about Jesus Christ there. You see where you're at? You're right there in, that, in those last days when the question is restoring again the kingdom to Israel. Here's the psalmist looking forward to that time prophetically. The twelve apostles are quoting it there in the book of Acts. Verse 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. They think they're getting rid of me, but they're just spinning their wheels. They don't realize what they're doing. Because I'm God. I'm the creator of heaven and earth. And I'm just laughing at them. Their, their puny little efforts. Look at what's, what's the very first word in verse 5? 
What's the word there? Then. When all of this happens here after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the stage is set for something to happen then. Verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his what? wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. God is angry. You know why God is angry? They just crucified his son. When these things happen and these things take place, what's the next thing prophetically that was supposed to happen? Look up there again. The days of vengeance, then wrath. Read the passage here. Um, he says, um, he's going to vex them in his sore displeasure. Look at verse 9, well, verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. This is God the Father saying, Jesus, you're about ready to take back the earth. It's yours. Um, he says, verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Does that sound good? What was... Pro we're talking about prophecy. Speaking about there's a kingdom from the foundation of the world. The whole issue has been a kingdom. That kingdom is going to be preceded whoops, by some days of vengeance and wrath. That was the very next thing in prophecy. Okay, that was 1,900 years ago. Where's the wrath? Where's the vengeance? Did God change his mind? Did God say, no, I don't think I can win? <laughs> no. God had something outside of prophecy. God had a secret. Go back, go back to the book of Acts. Go back to the book of Acts chapter 3 and get Romans chapter 16. Acts chapter 3 and Romans chapter 16. These two verses changed my life about 40 years ago. When I saw this comparison, and we've, been, we've talked about it briefly already, there's prophecy, what God has been talking about and talking about all along. Acts chapter 3 verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, how long? since the world began. He's been talking about this right from day one. The restitution of all things. Restoring the earth. Restoring order here. Romans chapter 16. The, the wrath didn't come. The kingdom didn't come. What happened? Romans chapter 16 verse 25. Romans 16 verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. You know who the my is there? It's another apostle. It's the apostle Paul. My gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was what? Kept secret since the world began. He has something that he's been talking about all along but he has something hidden that he's not told anybody about. What, is, what does it have to do with it has to do with the but now. Where's the kingdom and where's the wrath? It's postponed. And instead of vengeance and wrath, what did God do? He offers grace and peace to the world. Wow. In prophecy, the response to the cross was wrath and vengeance. The, cro the, the cross created enmity and hostility and payback for mankind. You know what the cross does today? It makes peace. Because of some new information about the cross. He calls it the revelation of the mystery. A hidden program. Come with me to the book of... You're right here in Romans. Turn to the next book, the book of 1 Corinthians. This mystery is some information about the break, the interruption in prophecy, and a wonderful new time when God opens his hand and offers grace. 
to a world that killed his son. You talk about grace and long suffering. Somebody murders my boy, I'm ready to go to it with him. <laughs> right? God, instead of, see, you know why? Because of what the cross was accomplishing for God. He knew that the cross was, was necessary. It was going to pay for sin. 1 Corinthians. Here's Paul talking, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. How long has God had this secret? Since way back over here. <laughs> before the world, God had this in mind all along. He just didn't tell anybody about it. Okay? He says in verse 8, this, this wisdom which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If God lets the cat out of the bag, guess what? He doesn't get man to do the dastardly deed of cru crucifying his son. This mystery was a wonderful secret that enabled man and Lucifer and Satan to do the very deed that was going to be the undoing of them. It was a wonderful secret with none of the prisons of this world knew. What is this mystery? It has to do with this hidden program for the body of Christ, a new group of people with a new hope and a new destiny. And guess what? God had a program from, for the earth. He's been talking about it all along. But, you know, he says, in the beginning, God created the, what? Heaven. heaven. We haven't heard very much about heaven, have we? The issue is God had a purpose to do the same thing in the heavens that he was going to do on the earth with a different group of people. He just never told anybody about it. Because if he'd let the cat out of the bag, he wouldn't have gotten his enemies to do the very thing that brought down their own undoing. What a glorious thing. This mystery. You're here in 1 Corinthians. Go to, first, go to 2 Corinthians. Go to the very next book. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This new group of people, it's, going to, it's called the body of Christ. Um, a, a, a new group of people. Not a national entity, but a, a spiritual group of people of which you and I are today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at what the Apostle Paul says. Here, I tell you to get there and I don't get there. Chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's if we die, this body dies, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. Where? Eternal. Where? In the, In the heavens. What did God promise Abraham for an everlasting possession? The earth, the land. What does God promise for us? A heavenly place of residence. A heavenly population. That's our, that's our purpose. That's what we are all about. When we talk about the scriptures, we're talking about basically two... We're talking about one great purpose in two realms. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What happened to both? They were corrupted. God is going to restore order here on this earth through a kingdom. That's the subject of prophecy. It's been spoken since the world began. It involves the twelve apostles, and the nation of Israel, and the earth. Then we have the but now, we have the mystery. A body of truth and a purpose kept secret since the world began. We have another apostle, the man Paul. We have not a nation, not a nation but a a church called the body of Christ and our hope and our destiny is where? The heavenly places. And God through the body of Christ is going to restore order in heaven and use us to operate there. Isn't that neat? 
That's the difference between something he's been talking about all along called prophecy and the mystery. That's the basic division in the Bible when we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth. Recognizing those two purposes, their goals and how they function and how they operate. And it's wonderful. And it's the key to understanding the Bible. Can you understand just the, the difference between two purposes and program? Yeah, there's all kinds of detail, isn't there? But when you see the big picture, the big picture is just basically a, a, a program spoken since the world began concerning the earth and a program kept secret concerning the heavenly places. That's how you, that's, and recognizing that difference and maintaining that distinction helps you understand your Bible. You know what people do today? They basically throw the whole thing together and they mix it all up. And it's confusing. But this wonderful purpose today, and see, they both involve what? Jesus Christ and the cross. The cross is the center point of both of them. He had to shed his blood and pay for sin for both the nation of Israel and for us. We just have more information about the cross today. Isn't that wonderful? That's the great key to understanding your Bible. Today, we understand the death of Jesus Christ on the other side of the cross and what it means in total. That Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Okay? That's neat. <laughs> That's simple, isn't it? Okay, do you have a question? We're getting ready to eat here pretty quick. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes, Bruce. Yes, the question for those that might be listening, the question, do the Jews get the earth and we get the heavens? Yes. Yes. Because God wants to restore, the, they were both corrupted initially, weren't they? He just didn't tell anybody about the purpose he had for the heavens. Because if he'd have left the... See, all God had to do was keep a secret. And he caused Satan to commit his own undoing. It's kind of like if you, in football, if you have a team that likes to blitz a lot, you let them blitz. If you've got a quarterback that can just dump it off and throw it into the... Into the you, you cause the, your enemy's aggression to be the very thing that brings about its defeat. And see, what God is doing, when Paul talks about hidden wisdom, God is the creator. He's the mighty one. He could, just, he could have just squashed everything, couldn't he? But what he's doing is he's demonstrating that he is worthy to be trusted. Because all he had to do was keep a secret, and he caused his enemy to defeat himself. And what, what happens, though, is people want to try to push those things together, and they, they, they bring us back to the earth, the kingdom is bigger than just the earth. There is a, there's a structure, there's an order, there is positions of rank and authority in the heavens too. And that's going to be our reward and our destiny. And in the end, the whole thing, the heavens and the earth are going to be restored back to the way they were at the beginning. Okay? Jim. He's preparing that kingdom to bring that kingdom back. Um, there's places where he talks about great is your reward in heaven. We just talked about this Thursday night. Come to, come to the book of Revelation chapter 22, and I'll show you quickly. Revelation chapter 22. Jesus Christ is currently in heaven now, and when, when, when God turns back to that purpose... Um, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Okay, Revelation chapter 22, 22 and verse 12. Here's the end of the story. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. He's bringing his reward, he's bringing that kingdom and bringing the rule and authority back to the earth. He's bringing the reward with. The reward isn't 
forever in heaven. It's being stored up in heaven, and he's going to bring it back when he comes to the earth. Kyle. That's, it, it's the new Jerusalem is at the end. That's a thousand years later. But he comes back and he, he brings his reward and he rewards those people on the earth. You see that, how, he, how he, his reward is with him and he brings it, brings it back. I go to prepare a place and I'm, I'm preparing that, that kingdom, that authority. And ultimately it is the new Jerusalem, but that's, there, there's other things involved in that. But he brings it back to the earth. We are already up there in heaven. See, but, but that's not the subject in Revelation. Revelation is not talking about us. It's talking about the climax of that prophetic program. Okay? Good question. Anybody else? Arliss. Jesus rose from the dead. The devil probably thought, Jesus up now. Okay. Well, yeah, he was kind of surprised about that. The, res- the cross is predicted in the Old Testament, yeah. but very... There's very few references to the actual resurrection. They're, they are there, but you know that, that too is probably a surprise. So, yeah. Okay. All right. We've got some some goodies for lunch. Um, I'm going to save us the trouble, and uh, we're going to give thanks for the meal, and then we'll have a time of fellowship, and we'll come back together about about uh, one o'clock or so. All right. Father, thank you for this time in your Word this morning. We thank you for the wonderful truth of your Word that it is um, revealed to us in a way that we can understand it. Uh, we thank you for the, the, that your, the, your worthiness to be trusted and uh, for our privilege of participating in your plan and your purpose. We thank you for the gift of your Son on the cross to pay for our sins that makes it possible to, for us to enjoy eternal life. And we thank you now for this food that we're about to enjoy and the, the time of fellowship around it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.